Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at the basics of the autonomic nervous system. We'll also touch brief, briefly on the somatic nervous system. Now, this has taken me so many looks at charts and diagrams to straighten it all out, and I hope that the way that I've managed to organize and make sense of it helps you out too. It's important for us as anesthesiologists to understand the effects of the autonomic nervous system on our patient's physiology, as many times it's these effects that we either manipulate or that we use as our eyes to see what's going on with our patient while in the operating room or in the ICU because they can't always communicate with us. As such, having a tight grasp on this concept is super important when it comes to other topics such as certain pharmacology, reflexes, etc. Now, you can see that I've already kind of drawn everything out here and part of the reason is because this is a difficult topic for me to discuss and articulate well, uh, I found it very difficult to draw and write at the same time. So I've kind of pre-written some things and I'm just gonna circle things as I talk to try and draw attention to them for uh, understanding purposes. So the first thing we wanna do is define some of our terms. Uh, you can see up here the little green star and that's our acetylcholine molecule. And the acetylcholine molecule is the main neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system, as hopefully we know, is colloquially called the rest and digest system. Now, these little blue dots over here uh, represent epinephrine and norepinephrine, and these are the main neurotransmitters of the sympathetic nervous system. And again, colloquially named, this is our fight or flight response. So, as most of us know, there's an autonomic and a somatic portion to our nervous system. The somatic nervous system, displayed here on the left, from Latin soma, meaning body, controls our skeletal muscle. That is the voluntary movements that we can make. It controls our arms, our legs, fingers, toes, even our diaphragm when we breathe. So before diving into this, um, we also have our autonomic nervous system, and that's on this side. And autos means self or independently, and it's named because this is the part of the nervous system that controls itself. It runs without our willful control of it. Uh, things like peristalsis, things like our heart beating, we don't control any of that. It, it happens you know, independently. So the one point that I want to make, and this is kind of a big take home point, it was really important for me because I never noticed it before. And I also struggled to remember it constantly, and I don't know why. Uh, I'm going to draw it up here. The first receptor in every system is always a nicotinic receptor and it is always acetylcholine that interacts with it. I don't know why I used to get jumbled up. I would forget which had the muscarinic receptor where and the alphas and betas and in which order. But if you know nothing else, always remember the first receptor in every system is always a nicotinic receptor that responds to acetylcholine, and it'll really go a long way. Now, if we take that point and we look back at the somatic nervous system here on the left, all we have to remember is that the somatic nervous system goes from the central nervous system directly to its receptor, directly to the muscle, which is where the somatic nicotinic receptors are. So the pathway for nicotinic, for somatic nervous system is only acetylcholine interacting with its somatic nicotinic receptor. Now, this is also why, because this is a somatic nicotinic receptor, why rocuronium and vecuronium and our paralytics, they all block here. But as you can see, none of our other nicotinic receptors are somatic. And that's why these type of paralytic agents don't paralyze the parts of the autonomic nervous system. And that's really the bread and butter of the somatic nervous system. Now we're going to move on to the autonomic nervous system, which is obviously a bit more confusing, but I really hope to kind of make this very simple for everybody. So the one here in blue is our parasympathetic. And I just remember parasympathetic is a P and the preganglionic fibers are longer. Again, there's no rhyme or reason. That's just kind of how it sticks in my brain. And as I mentioned before, acetylcholine is going to be our 
main neurotransmitter in this nervous system, and it's going to be here and here, both at the first signaling pathway at the nicotinic receptor, remember, but these are ganglionic, and the second one being at the muscarinic receptor uh, at closer to the, the target organ. Now, this parasympathetic reaction, like we said, is going to cause a rest and digest response. What this means is that it's going to cause slowing of the heart because you don't need to run or fight. It causes constriction of the pupils because you don't need to open up more to get more light in to see as much. And it also means that you get constriction of your bronchus because you don't need to breathe as much or as fast. This is why giving neostigmine, one of our acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that we talk about in another video, without a muscarinic antagonist, such as atropine or glycopyrrolate, can cause hypotension and bronchospasm, as well as severe bradycardia. So again, important to uh, give a muscarinic antagonist anytime you give uh, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So now these other three pathways here are sympathetic pathways, again, underlining here in gray, and our sympathetic pathways, like we said, are our fight or flight responses. And just like I mentioned before, the first receptor in all of these are going to be our nicotinic receptors, and they're all going to have acetylcholine as their first neurotransmitter. Now, our first chain here, the one right next to our parasympathetic, uh, these are going to go to all the same places that our parasympathetic does in order to counteract the effects. But down here, our second messenger here, our second um, neurotransmitter is going to be epi and norepi, and that's really going to be the main neurotransmitter in our sympathetic nervous system, and it's going to interact with our alpha and our beta receptors down here. And hopefully we know that epinephrine is also called adrenaline, and it does exactly what you think it's going to do. It's going to increase your heart rate, it's going to bronchodilate, uh, it's going to dilate your eyes, all of these things in order to get you ready to fight or run away. Now, it also makes sense, and the next pathway over here, that the sympathetic nervous system also innervates the adrenal glands, or adrenal, or on the renals, or on the kidneys, and this is where your epi and norepi is made. And so, sympathetic stimulation via that nicotinic receptor and that acetylcholine will cause the adrenals to then dump epi and norepi into the bloodstream to get it out to your tissues. Now, thirdly, over here, we have our sweat glands, which I've underlined in the bottom right corner. And hopefully we should all know that when you're getting ready to fight or flight or run uh, sympathetic stimulation, you sweat. And part of it is because it's a, a method by which your body can cool you. And this is a unique system in the sympathetic nervous system because it actually uses acetylcholine twice as opposed to epi or norepi. And it actually uses a nicotinic receptor as its first uh, receptor, but it uses a muscarinic receptor as its second receptor on the sweat gland. So a great way to remember this is that patients, for example, who are beta blocked, so you've kind of put this big X on your, your beta receptors, if they start to experience major types of stress, or sometimes you'll see it with patients who are going into a hypoglycemic state, they won't be able to affect change in their sympathetic nervous system because their beta receptors are all kind of held off, they'll still start to sweat. And that's because their sympathetic nervous system is firing and that may give you some insight, even though you've given medication that has stopped the normal response, the sweat glands in that case give you uh, insight into what's actually happening. So this is the basics of the autonomic and somatic nervous systems. Again, I, I hope it made it easy for you because going through it this way definitely did for me and I was really bad at this before. Uh, follow up this video with the pharmacologic effects of the autonomic modulators uh, as easy as resting and digesting. There I'm gonna take a look at recognizing the very simple way certain medications affect the patient. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please email me. Otherwise, subscribe below, follow us on Instagram at Count Backwards from 10, and stay tuned for the next video.